Hello and welcome to this IAU CIHE joint uh, webinar on the future of higher education. I am Gerardo Blanco. I'm an associate professor and academic director of the Center for International Higher Education. And it is my pleasure to welcome you all uh, to this webinar. Before we continue with our program, I am just here in charge of a few housekeeping um, items. First of all, we ask you to please, uh, unless you are one of our presenters, uh, we ask you to please mute your microphone and turn off your camera. This helps us not only to keep all of our attention to our panelists, but also it also uh, helps with the uh, bandwidth, uh, which is nowadays a precious commodity in events like these. Uh, as well, we invite you to use the chat function to share your questions. Uh, this is uh, one of the great opportunities with that uh, approach is that you don't need to wait until the end of the presentations. If you think of a question, you can type it in the chat. We will be monitoring those and we will make sure that we get to as many of those questions as we can uh, at the end of the presentations uh, by our panel. I also wanted to remind you that this um, uh, webinar will last about 90 minutes, so about an hour and a half. Um, and also we want to remind you that this session is being recorded. Um, this way we can uh, continue the conversation and we can share some of the very important insights that our panelists will be uh, sharing with all of us. This is also another good reason to uh, mute your microphone and turn off your camera if you um, you know, if you prefer not to be recorded live during this session. We do post uh, these recordings on our YouTube uh, channel and we will share um, the recording with everybody who registered uh, for this event. Well, without any further ado, it is my uh, greatest pleasure to welcome our distinguished panel comprised by Professor Jenny Lee from the University of Arizona. Professor Ahmed Bawa, uh, who is Chief Executive Officer of Universities South Africa, as well as Professor Carolina Guzman Valenzuela from the Universidad de Tarapacá in Chile. Welcome uh, to all three of our panelists. This is, by the way, the same sequence that we will have for their opening remarks. Uh, and also, I now have uh, the pleasure of giving the floor to our dear colleague and partner in organizing this event, Dr. Hilish Van Land from the um, International Association of Universities. The floor is yours. Thank you uh, very much, Gerardo. Uh, it is a great pleasure to co-host this event uh, again today on such an important topic, uh, research cooperation today, and what it means for today and for tomorrow. Um, so I'm, I'm really pleased to, to actually maybe recall some of the IAU um, uh, principles upon which we have uh, developed the International Association, as we believe that these still, uh, after 70 years, are valid for building strong higher education cooperation into the future. So let me please take maybe three to five minutes, if you agree, you just cut me off if I go over time. But I think that it's important to recall that for over 70 years, the IU has fostered, developed, and maintained links with academics and their communities and with the leadership in particular, and with academic experts in uh, the various IU focus areas, but also in research in general, all over the world, including in country, countries with totalitarian regimes or at war today. The world needs increased cooperation and not less. Founded in 1950, after two world wars and under the auspices of UNESCO, the International Association of Universities is indeed a global association of higher education institutions and also organizations from around the world. And we value that a lot for cooperation in general and research cooperation in particular. 
I use an independent non-governmental uh, organization and a membership-based one. As a global forum for leaders of institutions and associations that we see taking part today in this important uh, event, IU convenes and connects some 600 members from more than 130 countries to identify, to reflect, to act on priorities of common concern. And the IU acts as a global voice of higher education to a wide range of international and intergovernmental organizations, and in particular to UNESCO. Members avail to a wide range of services, but they're not uh, only for them. They're really for the higher education community at large. And we hope that uh, uh, through those services, we can contribute to enriching the research uh, cooperation dynamics that uh, we see unfold. Um, around the world. So IU strongly believes that more countries and that actually all countries should be part of the dialogues that we develop. And that's why we again see in the, the event today, uh, the many uh, partners from so many different horizons coming together. And we hope you will have good questions for us so that we can together uh, discuss uh, the future of higher education cooperation. And uh, we also see that higher education has a key role to play in um, um, reinforcing our research capacity everywhere in order to better exchange, to better sh uh, share uh, the, the knowledge that we um, all develop in our various institutions so that we can tackle the grand challenges that we face and those that are identified in the, the UN Agenda 2030 and uh, specified in the various sustainable development goals. Only through enhanced and quality international research cooperation and trust in that cooperation will we be able to address the challenges that we, we face. Take for instance one, no poverty. I mean, how can we uh, ever uh, address that grand challenge if we don't work together all around the world? Take 10, reducing inequalities. Same, we need to really bring our heads and, and our intellect together and enhance our capacity to develop connecting research um, uh, centers from around the world. Take climate change. If we don't work together, we will never uh, be able to address the different challenges we face. So I use promoting and advancing a dynamic leadership role for higher education in society, and we will continue to do so with all the universities around the world. We promote collaboration, research cooperation, and we do that by also articulating the fundamental values and principles that underpin this pursuit and the dissemination and application of knowledge. Because the IU strongly believes that we need to advocate for the kinds of policies and practices that respect diverse perspectives and promote social responsibility. So there is a need for a particular uh, and uh, emphasis and re-emphasis today on values, on leadership, and we need to act uh, together uh, in order to encourage innovation, mutual learning and cooperation around the world. We also believe that uh, the kind of uh, research cooperation that will thrive best and will ensure best possible quality for of relevance locally and globally will need to be developed following core values among which I would like to highlight the following. Academic freedom, institutional autonomy and social responsibility locally and globally research cooperation and sol solidarity based on mutually, uh, mutuality even of interests and shared benefits, the tolerance of divergent opinions, the freedom from political interference, which is under threat <laughs> even more so today and too often, equity in access and success in higher education and open access to knowledge, scientific integrity, ethical behavior as cornerstones of conduct for all stakeholders in higher education, not only in the administration, but also in teaching and research, and higher education and research in the public interest and quality in learning, research, and outreach. I share these again because they're on our website and people know that the IU stands for these, but we believe it is important to put these at the at the forefront when discussing the future of international cooperation. 
So we work to enhance higher education's community's role and actions in advancing societies worldwide. And as a global uh, organization representing the many voices in the full spectrum of higher education institutions and their associations, we hope that the future will be one of cooperation and not closing up and, um, and dividing ourselves when it comes to research. We need uh, the higher education community to be reinforced and the research cooperation to be seen as the key to the future. And we call on governments to support their research infrastructures and foster international open cooperation and prevent as much as possible competition. We also call on governments and research councils to ensure proper research funding for better research infrastructure and ensure that the values upon which the research will be carried out are those that can help advance the world for the better. So these are some ideas to start with and uh, a backdrop against which we can, these can be challenged of course, and I hope we uh, will have a very fruitful discussion on the future of research cooperation around the world. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. And now it is my pleasure to welcome Professor Jenny Lee. Well, thank you, um, Geraldo, to all the organizers for this opportunity to present my work on this very timely and important topic. So before delving into US and China specifically, I want to more broadly frame my remarks with a rising, if not urgent, concern about the ways that geopolitics is shaping international research today. Right now, of course, we're entering an extremely tense and uncertain times regarding the future of Ukraine. As Karen Fisher recently covered in the Chronicle, Ukraine's Ministry of Higher Education has called for an academic boycott of Russia. And some universities, including my very own, as well as throughout Europe, have divested and ended any international partnership with Russian higher education. While the extent of academic collaboration with Russia pales in comparison to China, the concerns for knowledge production are paralleled. Geopolitics will, are, and will continue to shape global science, thereby placing limits on the extent of research discovery across borders. We know that science is inherently borderless and key in solving the world's problems and preserving our planet in the future, as indicated in the opening remarks. And yet, when national interests and global competition enter in, scientific breakthroughs that could have made been possible may be lost opportunities. In addition to contributing to our knowledge base, academics throughout the world play a significant role as they're up oftentimes important fo forces in political dissent. These include thousands of Russian academics who are facing criminalization and publicly opposing the invasion of Ukraine. Yet our solidarity with, yet in our solidarity with Ukraine, Will isolating Russian scholars really stop Putin? The logic is not there, and sentiments towards ind indiscriminate blanket bans, such as expelling all Russian international students, for example, might be short-sighted. This is also the case with the US and China. The US's focus on China, of course, is not random, nor is it based on empirical data to demonstrate there was cause for alarm. Rather, in 2017, China surpassed the US as the world's largest producer of scientific articles. China is also the second largest R&D spender followed by the US. Together, these two countries account for almost half the world's R&D spending. Yet China's rise over time has been remarkably much faster. Based on a bibliometric study published last year with John Hout, we found that China's scientific trajectory has been accelerating at a much higher publication rate compared to the US. With or without the US, China will continue to rise. Yet for the United States, the trajectory is much flatter and the slight upward trend has been supported by US's scientific collaboration with China. In other words, the US needs China more than China needs the US when it comes to scientific production. Although this is not a fact that many politicians in the US will readily admit. Despite such indisputable trends, geopolitical agendas and anti-China public opinions have been proven to have a far greater effect on policy. 
It is no secret that the US and China have engaged in much international rivalry on the world stage. Then President Trump had called for a report based on a zero sum presumption that China was having a negative impact on the US. This eventually led in 2018 to the China initiative and continued through the Biden administration until very recently. It was created to protect against external threats that would undermine US competitiveness with a focus exclusively on China. To add some added context to the China initiative, the Department of Justice pointed to universities as notable targets of intellectual espionage. The higher education sector was described as vulnerable and that institutions are places that would naively house spies who would then collect information to be used against the US. While academic leaders express public support for the Chinese academic community, including its valuable students, universities in the end complied, especially from pressure from federal funding agencies. Consequently, the China Initiative has had a disastrous effect in the lives of many Chinese heritage scientists who are falsely accused and resulted in little, if any, effectiveness in actually combating intellectual theft. Next, I'll share some of my research with Xiao Ji Li in the Committee of 100. I'm proud of the fact that this research that I'll be sharing with you today was widely publicized in major media news outlets throughout the US and even abroad and helped to inform the end of the damaging initiative. This research made clear that the witch hunt for Chinese spies was undermining the Department of Justice's intended goals. In trying to compete with China, the US was actually sabotaging its own efforts by shedding an unjust spotlight on scientists of Chinese descent. I will briefly share in my remaining time three key findings, um, and this was also summarized in an upcoming issue of Boston College's International Higher Education publication. So first, despite anti-China public polls throughout the US and even bipartisan scrutiny over China, Scientists overall recognize the high value that Chinese scientists offer. Over 90% of our 2000 respondents believe that Chinese scientists make important contributions to the field. And over 80% agree that the US should build even stronger research collaboration with China. As for their own particular research, still around an impressive three fourths perceived that collaborating with Chinese scientists was important. Second, and this part received the most media attention, there is a clear pattern of racial profiling. Despite the shared value for collaboration among Chinese and non-Chinese alike, Chinese scientists were more likely to suffer from racial profiling compared to non-Chinese. Our Chinese scientists in this survey reported difficulty in great obtaining research funds and other professional challenges which they attributed to their race and or country of origin and one in two Chinese scientists felt fear or anxiety of being surveilled by the US government. These proportions were far lower for non-Chinese scientists. Third, racial profiling has negative consequences for the US enterprise, which drew widespread attention, regardless of one, how one feels about China. Scientists reported suspending collaboration with China, limiting communication with China, not involving China in future projects as a direct result of the DOJ's Depart China initiative. As many commented, the risk of being wrongfully targeted was simply not worth it, especially as China cases made national news. Most were exonerated and cases were dropped, but their careers and research projects were devastated. Scientists also reported changing their topics to those that were less sensitive, working with open rather than secure data, avoiding federal funding, all of which might have otherwise triggered an FBI investigation. Such precautions are reasonable, but in the end showed the potential to hurt US's position in scientific discovery. Another consequence has to do with scholarly mobility. Graduate students, postdocs, even tenured professors shared that they are considering furthering their careers in other countries that they feel that they would be more welcomed and safe. Thus, the US risks sending the very expertise that they hope to maintain directly to China and other countries. There is some potentially good news to this story. In last week's address, Assistant Attorney General for National Security, Matthew Olson, 
announced the end of the China Initiative and introduced a more comprehensive plan that would not focus solely on China. He made clear that the China Initiative gave rise to the perception that the DOJ is singling out anyone of Chinese heritage. This is true as our study made clear to the public that even Chinese Americans, US citizens felt targeted. And Mr. Olson acknowledged what we found that there was indeed a chilling effect. In the end, the DOJ finally observed that the China Initiative was harming the way US in ways that were counterproductive to their goals in trying to compete with China. While this change is a relief for many, the scientific community remains guarded. And although there's a wider scope of countries, it remains uncertain how universities will require, monitor, and sanction violations in conflict of interest disclosures. Policies remain vague in ways that do not, that policies remain vague for even those who do not intend to misrepresent or hide are too easily found to be in violation. And as the China Initiative cases have shown, failing to properly disclose is a serious criminal act as ongoing judicial cases continue. The spheres remain while the future of international collaborations will likely remain inseparable from geopolitics, even despite the empirical evidence and damages along the way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and we really look forward to engaging with our audience in, in the q and I am sure there will be a lot of important reactions and questions. Thank you very much, uh, Jenny. And now it is my pleasure to uh, give the floor to Professor Ahmed Bawa. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank uh, CIHE and IAEU for inviting me to, do this, to be a part of this panel. And this discussion it's such an important uh, discussion for her for us to have especially at this point in time when we are experiencing such a uh, upheaval in europe um I, I just want to begin by saying that we've had uh, two major disruptions in south africa's higher education over the last uh, over the last five or six years between 2015 and 2017 uh, we had uh, major student upheavals at uh, at our universities, which brought the higher education system very much to a standstill. And there were two major issues. I mean, the one was uh, the issue around free education, uh, which was a, a really a translation, if you like, of uh, you know, what you might think of as uh, kind of the universities, that the role of universities in building a social mobility and so on, that that was being undermined by uh, kind of uh, increased tuition fees and so on really what we might think of as a commodification of higher education in the public sector. And uh, that was the one big topic that the students raised. And the second one, uh, which was uh, much more kind of comprehensive in some respects, was uh, a call for a kind of a decolonized education, uh, you know, taking into account our history as uh, uh, the, uh, 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 our, our history as a, in apartheid, uh, there was this call for higher education to de-link itself from that colonial past, if you like. And, and that was a, a second huge engine, if you like, for uh, debate and discourse and so on around the knowledge project of our universities. Uh, two very interesting topics that were brought onto the table by the students. And then, of course, we had COVID-19, which is a disruptor. Uh, just like it was in other parts of the world, and um, and and there were many lessons from uh, from the from COVID nineteen, uh, and uh, you know one has to say though that uh, the one thing that really kind of stood out for us was uh, just um, uh, the uh, the clear indication of uh, the deep inequalities in our system, the deep inequalities in our society, and of course the global inequalities, I mean, just uh, that that COVID-19 really uh, kind of highlighted, if you like, uh, the inequalities in uh, in those uh, different subsystems, if you like. And, and, and I think the critical issue about that is that it uh, really forced us to begin to rethink, if you like, uh, the role of universities uh, in society. And in particular, uh, you know, questions began to be asked about whether uh, universities uh, uh, were kind of complicit, if you like, you know, in the production of that inequality. Uh, and that was something which uh, uh, has really carried through in, in a lot of debate that's taking place now. 
Yeah, and I think that I want to, I'll tie that back, if you like, to, uh, to uh, you know, to this topic in a minute, but it seems to me that, the, you know, there are many reasons why this is such an important topic now. Uh, clearly, the issue of, uh, you know, uh, wars, uh, uh, despotism, uh, strife in many parts of the world simply shuts down high education systems. I mean, we're seeing that now in Ukraine, uh, but uh, we have to see that also in Syria, in Iraq, in uh, in Afghanistan, Afghanistan, in many parts of the world where there where there where there was war and where there has been strife. Uh, we see the shutting down of uh, university space, if you like, and and, and clearly uh, one has to think about uh, the implications of that, if you like, as we as we head into the future. If there are parts of the world where high education systems are are either uh, kind of not functioning or largely dysfunctional, if you like. So that's the one big issue, I think, that we have to keep in mind. And, and of course, the war in uh, Ukraine is just simply puts that back on the agenda in a very forceful way. Uh, but at the same time, of course, we have to remind ourselves that, this, uh, that what's happened in the Ukraine now is, of course, what happens, what has happened in other places as well. The second, of course, is uh, what uh, Professor Lee spoke about, which is the just the shifting geopolitics, uh, and uh, together with the shifts in geoeconomics, if you like, uh, uh, with the and and of course this is leading to serious fragmentation uh, that's occurring. And 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 Professor Lee, of course, spoke about the you know the fragmentation between the U.S. and China, but of course that has implications for other parts of the world, uh, where of course now you know where countries like South Africa, which have close relationships with China and the USA. And now being asked, you know, being forced to reconsider uh, those relationships, if you like. And now, of course, uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the case of South Africa, uh, there's a certain amount of kind of pride in South Africa or non-aligned status, if you like. So, so that's uh, something which comes to the table, if you like. But at the same time, I think what, what we are seeing is uh, increased pressure on systems like the South African system uh, to make choices, if you like, in different directions. And of course, that's, uh, that has serious implications for the future of higher education. Uh, and uh, and uh, thirdly, uh, I, I think we have to also just pay attention to the rise of uh, populism and the rise of neo-nationalism in many parts of the world and the implications that that is having uh, for, uh, you know, for, for society. Now, by the way, these are linked together, of course. I don't think they're de-linked from each other. But uh, alongside uh, the rise in populism, you're also seeing something else, which is uh, kind of the rise in anti-intellectualism, uh, the rise in kind of uh, uh, distrust, if you like, in science and experts and so on. And all, all of these have very serious implications for uh, the role of universities, you know, the role of universities, both in terms of their local context and in terms of their global context. So, so and we saw this, you know, with the, uh, with the whole issue around the COVID-19 vaccines, we see it uh, with the you know, the president of the USA sort of asking people to drink Lysol, like, you know, to, to deal with COVID-19 and so on. Just uh, that's on the one level. At the other level, of course, they're deep-seated cultural uh, kind of uh, uh, antipathies, if you like, uh, to, uh, to science and experts and so on. And that's something that we have to pay attention to. Uh, and, and, I, and, I, and I think that this is important, not because it's happening in one or two countries, but that this is a global trend, it seems, and something that we have to address in a, in a global fashion. And then uh, fourthly, I, 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 I go back to what I mentioned earlier, and that is just the intensification of inequalities, uh, inequalities within nations, between universities and in, in, in systems, in national systems, but also inequalities between nations and inequalities between high education systems, if you like, across the world. And, and, and that has huge implications for the way in which we kind of conceptualize the role of universities as, you know, as we head into the future. Of course, all of this is happening, as uh, uh, Kiligi kind of uh, indicated, all of this is happening at the time when we know that the grand challenges that are facing humanity are both intensely local and intensely global. They are simultaneously local and global, and that you have to deal with them at those two levels. 
Of course, that's also uh, addresses to some extent, you know, the issue of the, the issue raised by the South African students relating to uh, kind of decolonization, because it's really about saying that uh, South African universities really should enter the global knowledge system on the basis of their work context, if you like. I mean, that, that, that there's a need to couple uh, work at the local level with work at the, at the global level. And, and I think that you know, we're all fully aware of the fact that we can't address global warming simply by uh, dealing with it at, at, a, at the global level, and we can't deal with it simply by dealing with it at the local level, that these have to come together, if you like, uh, uh, to do that. And I'll come back to that uh, in a short while. And, and I think that what this means in essence is that universities have to work together, that universities have to, you know, buck the trend, if you like, of the tearing these systems apart and, 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 and take on this challenge of working together and producing uh, synergies in research and, and teaching and so on. I, I think there are a whole range of countervailing uh, opportunities, you know, that we can now tap into, if you like, you know, which really should guide us as we move into the future. The one is clearly just the global efforts to build a kind of open science platforms. Just this idea of saying, well, you know, if there's publicly funded research going on, we should make sure that that publicly funded research is, uh, is really for the public good. And it's not just public good at the national level, but it's for humanity, that we should really be, uh, we should really be kind of generating, uh, 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 generating more and more effort, if you like, uh, to get these open science systems to work uh, and, to, and to do it globally, so that it's really about bringing together these systems of science and the systems of higher education uh, on these open platform, uh, open science platforms. And, uh, and it seems to me at least that what that does is uh, provides us with the opportunity of beginning to think about uh, global commons of science and scholars and scholarship and making sure that actually there's a, that there's a, there's a general kind of uh, universal commitment, if you like, to, to this idea. Interestingly, of course, open science isn't happening, isn't happening in individual systems only. You know, there's, a, there's a tremendous global kind of movement now towards open science. And that becomes a platform uh, for us to work together. I mean, in, in some respects, I think there's still a tremendous amount of work to be done. I, it's still, there's still very much a, 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 a serious kind of work in philosophy and so on that needs the philosophical basis of open science still needs to be worked at and so on. But it is something of a platform that we can work with. The second is an obvious one which is just the digital technology revolution and its implications for uh, kind of opening the way for globalized uh, experiments, uh, globalized uh, collaborations and so on. And I, and I think that what we are seeing already you know, is uh, uh, kind of the, uh, the way in which uh, big research centers like, uh, like CERN in Geneva, I, I happen to be a particle physicist, so I have a particular leading towards CERN in Geneva. The, that CERN is now, of course, uh, you know, you don't have to be at CERN like to participate in those experiments anymore. You can, you know, you can stream the data wherever you are in the world. Um, uh, South Africa has, of course, the square kilometer array, which is uh, sort of in construction. Uh, and again, uh, that will be a major global effort, but it doesn't require scientists to be there. You know, it, it will really kind of be a global effort with people being located wherever they are. Uh, and like that, of course, there are a number of other opportunities for us uh, to begin to think about the way in which this uh, digital technology uh, revolution uh, has implications. Uh, I was told, for example, by uh, people, our, uh, by uh, virologists here in South Africa, that the first um, uh, genome of the COVID-19, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the very first one uh, was kind of delivered on Twitter. You know, uh, it was the South African scientists received it on Twitter. Right? Uh, that's another indication, really, of just how uh, integrated uh, the science systems have become, and 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 what the potential of this technology is to uh, to to help us with that. 
Now, of course, there's a whole range of negative aspects, you know, around the use of that technology. And clearly, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a technophile, a pure technophile. <laughs> I'm also very deeply aware of the need for us to, uh, to understand what the challenges are around the use of technology, but at the same time, understand uh, what the benefits are. The third one, and again, uh, Hiligia kind of really spoke about this, is the SDGs. I think the SDGs provide us with a fantastic opportunity to globalize the scientific effort, to really pull together and, and to bring together the local and the global again. I think that that's a, another fantastic opportunity that we have of bringing together the, uh, the, the, the university systems of the world to work together. Um, and the fourth one, which I uh, refers to what I ref you know, refers to one of my earlier points around the growth of uh, distrust and so on, uh, it, it does in fact relate to something much deeper. And it, this may not be the case globally, but certainly in South Africa, uh, there's a deep concern about the low level of social ownership of our universities, that our universities are not kind of socially owned as, as strongly as we would like. And that's something I think that really harks back, if you like, to this idea that we should really be building uh, kind of uh, you know, research enterprises that are both local and global, uh, that, that people in communities should really see themselves kind of uh, represented in the work of the universities, represented in the functioning of universities. So, uh, and that it should, they shouldn't be seen as kind of, you know, these institutions that are out there that are kind of really providing knowledge to communities, but rather to see them as kind of shaping uh, kind of uh, knowledge enterprises that address the grand challenges that we face all around. So those are four, I think, powerful impetuses that we could think about to drive um, uh, kind of global partnerships. I have just two points to finish with. I mean, the first one, um, it seems to me that, you know, if we can list all, all the core functions of universities and university systems, we can, you know, teaching and learning research and innovation and so on. Uh, but the one issue that has to be highlighted uh, is the fact that universities are amazing bridges between societies, that they really allow for the free flow of ideas and people, scholars and scholarship and so on. And that universities have to really take up this idea that they are these bridges, that notwithstanding, you know, the, the political, the, the, their, their, uh, their, their embedding in political economies, that they have to play this role of being bridges, you know, and to take on that challenge of being bridges between societies. Um, and, I, and I think that, you know, uh, part of that, uh, part of the, answer to that now comes from uh, the, the use of technologies and so on. But it does seem to me that universities should step up and really take on this role of uh, being these powerful bridges between societies. Uh, the second one is, um, is that universities are knowledge intensive institutions, you know, like, uh, uh, but they are different. They, they, they are special, you know, they are not CERN in Geneva or the square kilometer array in South Africa. The difference is that they have students. Uh, and so they have a direct responsibility, a direct responsibility to ensure that they do everything that they can do to, to create new generations of uh, critically engaged graduates who are both uh, local citizens and global citizens. Uh, and that's something I think which is a responsibility that they have to take on. Uh, and, and I think that what, it, what that implies really is, um, you know, is that there's a need for universities, even in times of difficulty, uh, to take on uh, this challenge of producing countervailing spa well, spaces for countervailing narratives, that even if we are moving towards narrow nationalisms, there's a need for universities to really step up and to, uh, to take on uh, the idea of, uh, of, 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 uh, 
of being kind of global institutions, which are locally connected, if you like. Um, and, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, uh, universities are completely central to this role of producing a global commons of uh, scholars, scholarship and science. Uh, and, and I think that that's uh, something which uh, I think we should all aspire towards. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bawa. And now it is my pleasure to give the floor to Professor Carolina Guzman Valenzuela. Thank you very much, Gerardo. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Fantastic. <laughs> thank you, Gerardo. Uh, thank you, Rebecca and Hidige for um, having me here. It, it is a pleasure to be here and share with you some thoughts about research collaboration. Um, what I am going to do is, is, is share with you some um, reflections about the very concept of research collaboration, uh, but with a focus on the social sciences. And I'm going to bring in um, a Latin American perspective because um, I am based in Chile. Um, so I'm going to share with you um, a very short PPT with some some points that I would like to highlight in this in this presentation. And also I'm going to present uh, some few data um, about our research project we are conducting right now. So in broad terms, uh, the very concept of collaboration has a, has a positive connotation and is valued uh, in, in different educational settings or different organizations. Through a collaborative and joint effort, individuals, groups, organizations, and countries work together to pursue a shared uh, goal. In academia, uh, these processes of collaboration are very important to produce new ideas, strategies in teaching, research, outreach, and, and so on. Um, in terms of research collaboration, um, the formation of research networks, for example, is, is very important. They help uh, academics to connect, but also they help uh, in processes of internationalization, uh, which, are, which are quite important um, uh, in these days. Um, so research collaboration uh, is a highly valued activity by governments, universities, and academics. However, and my point here is that collaboration as such is not neutral because it involves power relationships. Um, there are asymmetrical relationships uh, based on power. Uh, so some institutions, countries, or individuals um, are more powerful than the others. And this is especially so when we have collaboration um, between countries uh, that belong to the global north and the global south, east, uh, west, and so on. So there are geopolitical uh, considerations here that are very important. Um, much, of, much of the problem uh, of these asymmetries have to do with global trends in higher education, uh, competition for resources, prestige, uh, reputation. Uh, international rankings have played a very important role here. And for example, a, a very important indicator of research collaboration is, is um, co-authorships, patterns of co-authorships, articles uh, co-authorships. Um, in Latin America, for example, um, it is expected that academics work and collaborate uh, with colleagues uh, in other countries, but especially from, from the global north. This kind of collaboration is seen as strategic. Uh, it gives us, um, for example, the National Funding Body in Chile says that uh, it give, this strategic collaboration gives us um, visibility, prestige. And it is expected, for example, uh, in my country that we collaborate with the USA, Australia, Spain, Germany, France, and the UK. 
And this is not just Chile. There are many other countries in Latin America with the same expectations. Um, so there are also um, some agencies, the World Bank, OECD, that have been orchestrating a series of initiatives to, to promote collaboration and cooperation between rich and poor countries. Uh, and and these this, uh, types of collaborations have been shaping to some extent uh, the type of, um, of um, collaboration that takes place in the production of knowledge, and in some cases, um, these this collaborations or these partnerships between poor and rich countries uh, have been accepted by poor countries because there are many fin financial pressures. So uh, there are here some geopolitical imbalances that are important to highlight and at least in Latin America and, and of course in Africa, much of these imbalances have to do with a colonial and post-colonial legacy. And in academia and regarding research, for example, uh, what happens is that the knowledge produced in the South is less visible uh, than the knowledge produced in the North. But, but what happened, uh, particularly with the social sciences, um, the social sciences have a, a, an epistemic nature, an epistemic singularity. Um, and when we read studies about global science, usually these studies are focused on hard sciences, uh, STEM uh, uh, sciences. And these disciplines, these hard, hard, um, hard sciences have an immediate uh, economic impact, they produce innovation. It's possible to measure that impact and innovation. But when, when knowledge is produced in the social sciences, it's much more difficult to measure the impact or, or the innovation. Uh, so social sciences and also humanities have been under investigated. Some authors say that um, the social sciences are context dependent because we, we are focused on social phenomena that uh, are highly dependent on, on, on a specific context, countries, units. And also uh, ling there are language issues uh, here. Uh, for example, uh, in, I don't know, in physics uh, or biology, publications are in English while in the social sciences, usually the publications are in the lingua franca. And in Latin America, that means Spanish and Portuguese. So um, to some extent, and to put it in simple words, when we publish in Spanish, we know that uh, only a local audience is going to read as, as Spanish and we can be more visible if we publish in English, but there are a lot of limitations there. In any case, uh, the social sciences in, in, in Latin America has a, a very lively tradition with a lot of books, articles, but many of them, uh, many, many of the articles, for example, are published in, in, in low rank uh, journals. And in, as I said, in, in local language. So, let me share with you some, some data we have been um, collecting with my team. And if we analyze all the articles uh, published in the social sciences with at least one Latin American author between 2002 and 2018 in Web of Science and Cielo, Cielo is a very popular index here in, in Latin America and also in, in South Africa. We can see that there is an incredible increase in the number of publications of articles. So you can see that it's a very uh, active uh, 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 area of the study, uh, the social sciences. Um, Brazil, for example, led the gross number of published articles in the region. And this is not surprising because Brazil is a huge country with an incredible research capacity and a lot of investment in terms of research. 
However, when adjusted by numbers of researchers and, and of inhabitants, Colombia and Chile led respectively. And that is very interesting because uh, Chile, for example, is a very small country. Uh, uh, Colombia is a medium sized country compared with Brazil. Uh, it's like is, is an interesting uh, um, uh, data. Also, we found that um, most of the articles are single author articles. And this is not surprising because there is a tradition in the social sciences of um, single author papers, but it seems that this is changing. Uh, this is changing, and you can see this here. Uh, it seems that this tendency, this trend is decreasing, while collaboration, both within the same, uh, same, the same country and with other countries outside LATAM are increasing. So there is, there is much more collaboration with other countries. However, we found, and this is striking, and this is not the first time we, we find this, is that collaboration within Latin America is very low. And we, we are trying to find explanations for this trend, but we are still thinking very hard about what is happening. It seems that we don't collaborate with our uh, brothers and sisters here in Latin America. Most of us speak Spanish. Uh, it's much easier to collaborate uh, also with Brazil, but it seems that we don't do that. We only collaborate with the scholars within our countries, same countries, or with colleagues outside um, Latin America. So here you can see when, when uh, scholars in the social sciences collaborate with countries outside Latin America, you can see that the countries we collaborate the most, the United States, Spain, United Kingdom, France, Germany, Canada. I think that says a lot about our interests and uh, the type of collaboration we want, we want to build on. Um, anyway, um, there are different patterns. I cannot go in details here, but what I wanted to show, I, I just wanted to show that in this kind of dark green color, that there is very little collaboration across different, different countries within Latin America with other countries in Latin America. Yes, so most of the, most of the papers uh, we analyze are either single, uh, single author uh, articles or uh, they are collaborative papers with colleagues from the same country. So um, I'm going to conclude with some, some reflections about collaboration, about the social sciences as well. As we know, there is a lot of pressure to publish. It's like publish or perish, we know that phrase. And this is especially hard for young academics who are starting a, a, a career, and, but also for women. There are many uh, women imbalances. I, I, I'm not sharing with you data about gender, but we have found um, imbalances regarding first, the first author or the corresponding author, uh, for example, or the, uh, the, the number of, of papers published and led by, by women. So this pressure is, is on academics, not only in the global south or in the social sciences, but it's a pressure uh, around the world uh, in academia. In the global south, or at least in Latin America, uh, scholars have this, the dilemma of reaching an international audience in English or and becoming more global oriented or visible or publishing in Spanish or Portuguese and remaining local. So it seems that there are these two tracks between being international and being local, and there is an important tension there. Some scholars solve this tension. I myself solve that, that tension in trying to publish in both Spanish and English, but um, it's, it's, it's not an easy tension and um, we need some ideas to, to, to address it. Also, um, 
the social sciences have exhibited an epistemic na nationalism. And that means that it seems that the social sciences and also the humanities are quite enclosed uh, and context dependent sciences. So when we conduct research, we usually uh, conduct study cases which are very specific to uh, concrete contexts or, or countries. Collaboration with the global north is expanding, and, and this is this is it's not only a feature that we can see in Latin America, it's expanding around the world, and uh, there is a, a need of recognition, prestige, and strategic collaboration. Um, we also found uh, in our um, project that uh, Lat Latin American countries differ, and that means that the poorest countries usually are more dependent on uh, certain countries outside Latin America, for example, the United States, in order to um, publish papers and collaborate, while other countries have more research capacity. And this is the case of Brazil, Colombia, and Chile. And finally, um, and with this, I'm going to finish, um, it's, I, I can tell you that so the social sciences in, in Latin America um, is a very lively um, field uh, with a group of disciplines, quite different one from each other, but it's very active. The fact that, the fact that it remains a bit invisible to the rest or, or, or for an international audience is a problem because it's not that, that, that we don't produce knowledge, we produce a lot of interesting and high quality um, um, studies, but they are quite invisible um, to a global audience. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Carolina, uh, in, uh, for, for those perspectives. So this is uh, the call. Uh, we have been making this in writing throughout uh, to uh, all of you to uh, pose your questions. We'll try to get to as many of those as we can. And we are starting to see a few uh, of those coming in. So while we take a moment to organize those questions, I wanted to return to something that was said uh, in the presentations earlier, maybe just to get our conversation started. And um, in many ways, uh, Professor Bawa was sharing with us how in many ways, not only uh, it is uh, necessary to pay attention to this new geopolitical context, but also there seems to be a connection with the growth of anti-intellectualism, perhaps also the decline of expertise within uh, researchers' countries. So I was wondering if uh, anyone or perhaps all of our panelists would like to respond to this idea, which I just find so, so intriguing. Uh, in other words, do we, uh, in your, from the perspectives that you are sharing, are you also observing uh, a growth, uh, a sen an increasing sense of anti-intellectualism uh, domestically? in addition to these uh, geopolitical tensions uh, abroad. Uh, Jenny and Carolina, I don't know if you would like to uh, first respond to, to this, um, I think, quite interesting uh, propo proposition. Um, just to uh, iterate that this is certainly true in the US, um, Science denial has been around and is an, unfortunately seems to be a bigger concern, uh, whether it be global warming, whether it be COVID, um, you name it. And I think that this does very much tie into the broader theme of geopolitics when political agendas are overriding uh, empirical evidence. And more than ever, the, the importance of international collaboration and finding common truths um, through science is, is becoming increasingly important. Yes, I, I, I agree. I totally agree with Jenny. And I think that when we talk about research collaboration, I, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a need. I mean, it's important to collaborate. Um, as I mentioned, we can produce new ideas, new knowledges, uh, new 
networks and uh, we can enhance the research processes and this can have a, a this could, can be treated as a as a common good uh, for everyone when we produce knowledge collaboratively um, however m my point is that it seems that um, and I mentioned that in my presentation collaboration is is not neutral so my main concern here is that when we collaborate and when we belong to different uh, countries which are more powerful, less powerful, richer, poorer, or even from different universities within the same country with different status, I think that we really need to generate collaboration um, strategies in order to collaborate in a in a genuine genuinely way if not it's like it's like doing the exercise of doing things together but it's not a real collaboration um that that is my main concern and i think that um this this powers asymmetries are related to geopolitical issues but also to disciplinary issues it's not the same collaborating in the social sciences arts and humanities and collaborating in in the hard sciences so to me these two issues are important to to consider thank you very much ahmed i'm not sure if you would like to uh add or respond since uh, perhaps I have myself uh, misinterpreted or uh, some of your comments, but I would love to uh, maybe hear an elaboration on these from you as well. Yeah, no, I don't think you did. Uh, I don't think you did uh, misinterpret. I think uh, you, know, you did understand what I was trying to say. And I think that, yeah, it, it seems to me that it seems to me that there's a, a growing kind of, you know, uh, level of distrust you know, in science and now you know when one looks at the kind of at the you know what appear to be the dominant uh, you know the, the the dominant aspects, if you like, of the uh, relationship between science and uh, and and power and politics and so on, uh, you know one sees uh, perhaps a growing sense of importance, if you like. But you know, let's be clear about it. You know, in terms of the let's just looking at uh, you know, scientists in the UK at the moment are complaining about the fact that uh, that that Boris Johnson uh, picks and chooses, you know, uh, what he would like to hear from the scientists. See that that he doesn't look at the totality. Uh, so, so, so this. So, I think we have to be quite concerned about what's happening at this nexus between uh, science, power, politics, and profit. You know. Uh, and what's happening in that nexus, if you like it. And of course, that also drives to some extent uh, the kind of growing distrust in the general public, because you know people see that uh, the vaccine effort, for example, is really driven by uh, some big multinationals. They have a kind of, a, they see that as a kind of, you know, as an erosion, if you like, of uh, the independence of science and so on. So, so uh, now, of course, uh, Carolina raises a very important point. I think we have to be careful uh, not to paint a kind of a, a single, uh, use a single brush, if you like, to paint all the disciplines. I think it's uh, it's very complex. I think you know, but at the same time, I think what my perception is uh, is that uh, there's a need for us to reconstitute our thinking about the relationship between science and society. That there's a need for us to really pay attention. Uh, to the fact that uh, that there is this growing kind of uh, distrust. Now, you know, one might say, well, what that really requires is for us to spend more time talking about what we do. You know, uh, now, so that might be that might be valid, by the way, and I think that there might be some need for us to do that. But I I want to suggest, in fact, that there's something deeper. That there's something that it has something to do with the with the nature of our knowledge production, the nature of our, uh, the nature of our knowledge project, if you like, you know, uh, to what extent uh, is the general public, you know, seeing the development of vaccines as something that benefits them, you know, instead of seeing it as 
something that's imposed on them, you know, by science. So, so I think there's a need for us to really uh, spend some time contemplating these deep questions, I think. And I think that, that pertains both to the sciences and the social sciences, I think. Thank you. I think you're muted, Gerard. Sorry, uh, thank you very much. It doesn't matter how, my, how many times we do this, uh, there are some technical problems that are user generated as well. Uh, Kilich, please go ahead. I, I noticed that you have your hand uh, risen. Yeah, I see that there are not too, too many questions, so we have uh, ample time, time to, to discuss here. Um, uh, this sense of anti-intellectualism is also linked to uh, two other points that uh, Ahmed was ma making, um, and, and also two other points that Jenny and Carolina were, were um, uh, putting on the table. And uh, to take your words, uh, Ahmed, this deep concern about the low level of social ownership of our universities is a very important one. Um, and the, the, the fact that local people should see themselves as part of this system is still a problem that, that is not solved and something that is part of that um, kind of anti-intellectualism that is also uh, um, coming up. But um, what I find interesting is, is that we don't seem to be able to wake up to those calls and to really do something about it. We, uh, we see, on the contrary, that um, the, the communication on universities is, again, a, simpli a simplification of what universities stand for, what they do, what they can do. And we, as universities or the, the university leadership, actually should take these, uh, these considerations very seriously and make sure that they also uh, become these communicators about the values of uh, what a university stand for and what they have to offer. So maybe we can discuss that a little bit more. And I wanted to also go back to the points that uh, you, Jenny, were making, uh, was making at the beginning on this, um, this importance of continued cooperation and, um, around the world, despite borders, despite uh, uh, new um, uh, walls that are being built between uh, nations around the world. And you say uh, with so many words that science is borderless. And, and I would like to, to, for us to look at that again, because it's so um, incredibly important, especially also today we should be very careful about the danger of isolationism, the danger of uh, and th and that come with it of loss of opportunities to actually look at the important matters that matter and locally and globally, and which actually will not help address the other issues that are um, uh, being discussed already in this uh, in this uh, very particular session uh, against the backdrop that we know uh, today. Not only in Ukraine, not only the situation in Europe, but as everybody said, in so many other parts of the world, um, in, the, in the Middle East, in Latin America, in Africa, uh, we need to make sure that we continue to build these bridges between universities around the world, because it is through um, in, in cooperation that we can actually uh, break down the walls that we see arise in too many parts of the world. So I wanted to maybe see if we can continue the conversation on those points as well. It looks like Carolina is ready to go. So please go ahead, Carolina. Yes, I, I thank you, Gerardo. I just wanted to highlight the point about ownership and the ownership of universities and knowledge. And regarding knowledge production, for example, I think we need to do something in academia. It's not acceptable that um, we have to pay a lot of money uh, to have access to articles and all of us are working for these very big uh, organizations, enterprises, which are for-profit organizations. And we academics are contributing to that. But at the same time, uh, that knowledge that is published is not accessible to all. So I just wanted to come back to the idea of ownership, public good, public universities and the idea of all of us having access. I mean, in Latin America, 
for Latin American universities, it's very difficult to pay for these subscriptions. So um, we don't, only very rich universities in Chile, for example, have access to, to the, the best libraries. So it's difficult to produce knowledge if you don't have access to the articles. Uh, and so this is why Latin America has created this CLO database, which is which, database which is public and is financed by public universities. But I have to say that there are very few resources, and CLO is not perfect, of course. <laughs> but um, I think we really need to think about that, and we need to think about what we are doing as academics in order to break this this system, uh, which is so unfair and so profit-oriented. Um, if I could just um, also respond as well. I mean, let's, I think we, I'd like to center more of this on just the geopolitical realities in addition to the inequalities that were discussed. Science is unquestionably being bordered. And I think that that is an urgent concern in ways that federal priorities, federal funding, defunding of science are shaping what scientists do, what they study, what they have access to, um, and what they are able to share publicly. So these are real concerns that I think the higher education sector for so long has been speaking within a higher education context bubble. And I think that yes, connecting it to SDGs and to what's happening in the world is a really noble and important pursuit, but let's also keep in, count the, keep in mind the geopolitical realities that are shaping how scientists do their work and the kind of knowledge that's being produced and where it's being transmitted and what is being suppressed. Earlier, there was a comment about, question about populism. Populism generally does not support science. And the linkage between that, and this is, I think, is our responsibility, in some ways our fault, is that science and research, higher education institutions are often seen as very elitist. And especially international higher education is seen as something that only few can access, few can benefit from, and the rest are left behind, right? And I think this, of course, is a terrible misconception. I think there are ways that we can address this in who we partner with, in how we partner, what the partnership looks like. Um, just because there's mutuality doesn't mean there's equality. So what, in what ways can we combat some of these notions that are actually suppressing our very work um, in the social sciences as well? And so I think that we, need to combat these issues, take a reality check, see them head on and go beyond the confines of our ivory towers. Um, lastly, um, I am doing a study right now. We're talking to Chinese and US-based scientists who are collaborating with each other on COVID-19. And despite COVID, which is often used as the reason why things are going down, that's not the case. Um, and despite the geopolitical tensions um, between the two countries, scientists are still coming together. They have agency and it's largely built on trust. And much of this is because of international mobility, because they were former students, postdocs, they have an extended relationship. So, you know, I came in with a hypothesis that they were coming because they were trying to solve you know, find a vaccine or solve this uh, terrible pandemic. Um, it, th these aren't strangers that are coming together. This isn't because one was from an elite institution. It, it wasn't based on these artificial explanations. It was really based on trust that had been created large in part to international mobility. So all of this to say that the geopolitical context plays a powerful role. I think it needs to be more centered and acknowledged, but also how do we create these mutually beneficial capacity building types of collaboration um, that really does address the SDGs and, and global problems in a more powerful way. Thank you very much, Jenny. And I think uh, I think we're all very eager to see uh, this work uh, and this research that you're working on. Um, I, I think one point that I would like to address uh, from the panel, from as many of you as you as you wish, is this idea of the incentives, perhaps the system of incentives 
uh, related to research, or perhaps we could talk at times about disincentives. Uh, Carolina, for example, in some of the examples that you were sharing, uh, where there is very little within region out of country cooperation. I would imagine that perhaps there might be a set of messages sent to scholars about the type of institutions and countries that they should be collaborating. Uh, Jenny, to speak of these incentives, I cannot think of anything more chilling than the prospect right here in the United States to be investigated. By the way, uh, many of these are secret uh, investigations, right? The subjects of these uh, investigations are not notified until there is perhaps an indictment or an arrest, uh, as quite spectacularly we witnessed um, uh, uh, across different parts of the United States. Uh, certainly, um, there are perhaps fears of the kind of uh, lack of trust that we could have as we choose research partners, uh, sort of converse to Jenny, what you were saying uh, in your observations on ongoing research. Can we talk about perhaps some of the institutional and beyond the institution set of incentives or disincentives that are shaping uh, individual choices by academics about research collaboration? Um, I can start with the, with the case of Chile for example, and uh, as, you, as you said, Gerardo, uh, there are some policies shaping uh, collaboration. So our national funding body is pretty clear about who they want us to collaborate with, which countries, I mean, uh, and the type of publications they are expecting. And uh, for example, if, uh, if you, if you finish a, a project, which is called Fondesit here, uh, you cannot close it until you publish either a Web of Science or a Scopus article. If it is a CLO article with the indexation of, of, uh, of CLO, it doesn't count. So there are a lot of policies. Uh, much of these policies are, in my view, uh, are linked to this, these international narratives, hegemonic narratives about uh, international rankings, about publishing with some countries, trying to be visible, trying to get more reputation, knowing that Latin American countries will never be part of these 100 highest positions in the, in the RU ranking, for example. We know that. So, but even knowing that, policies uh, in Latin America and particularly in Chile, because Chile is a very a special case, very uh, uh, a country which is very mar uh, marketized. Um, all the higher education system is, is privatized almost. And we are very much looking um, towards international rankings and reputation. So all these narratives are then put in po national policies, and then these policies are uh, set and developed in, in our universities. And that shapes uh, the way we conduct research, the way we publish, the way we collaborate with others. So that is very in very simple ways, uh, in very simple words, uh, what is happening in Chile. But I am aware that in other countries in Latin America, there are similar dynamics, although they are not as extreme as they are in Chile. Thank you. Well, feel free to return to these, but I'm very excited now to share a question coming from uh, the chat. This is coming from uh, Noel Kufaine. Uh, who is, uh, besides sharing a few important observations about the significance of going back to the communities where we are collecting data, maybe uh, in specific uh, reference to social science research. But the question at the core of this comment is, how do we take um, the research results 
to the local community? I think this is a question that many of us are contending with, right? And I think it has been an important subtext across uh, the different presentations about all three, by all three of you, uh, very often, uh, critiquing right uh, the isolation in which uh, university researchers we often conduct our activities so how do we take these research results uh, back to the community and perhaps when we talk about international collaboration we are talking about communities in more than one national context perhaps i could uh, just kick off at the, uh, and so I have to emphasize that I'm not a social scientist, so, you know, uh, but let, let me just begin by saying, you know, that, uh, you know, if we begin a research project in the context of sort of an applications imperative rather than in terms of an academic imperative, and then almost immediately, uh, you know, you come to the conclusion that academics are not in the best position to define the question, right? That the question has to be co-created, that there has to be collaboration, if you like, in creating the question. Uh, and, 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 and the creation of that partnership then uh, has to also include kind of uh, what the nature of the outputs are, because publishing in a peer-reviewed journal uh, will then sort of negate the idea that you really want an application's output, if you like. You know? so, so you have to then contemplate the idea that there must be multiple outputs like that. Of course, you know, as academics, we have a responsibility to publish in peer-reviewed journals and so on. But in the, if we are engaging in a context that, uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in a project that is shaped in the context of an application's imperative, then there has to be other kinds of outputs which kind of feed into the context in which that project is set, if you like. You know? So it seems to me that one of the ways to think about this is this idea of, uh, of shaping, uh, you know, shaping research questions together, uh, because academics sitting at the, in their offices uh, may not be the best position to kind of determine what the key questions are. Now, there's a second thing that happens, by the way, the moment you start with an, with an applications imperative, then something else happens. You see, the world is not so kind, right, to divide itself up into disciplines. So almost immediately, you're forced to kind of develop a, an interdisciplinary team, like a, around an applications-based uh, input. So, so that's another change to this knowledge kind of enterprise, if you like it. Uh, I think it was uh, Carolina, I think, which kind of who indicated, you know, just uh, the extent to which uh, in, in, the, in the natural sciences, even in physics, like, I mean, the, 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 the general trend is that there are multiple authors, like, you know, people coming in with different kinds of expertise into a project, whereas in the social sciences, it's very often kind of a single author. The, so, so maybe that's a part of the big challenge I think we face. I don't know if that's helpful or makes it more complicated, but I thought I'll say that. Thank you. Uh, Hilish, go ahead, please. Yeah, ju just quickly to add to your question and, and thank you for already the responses. I was really uh, um, intrigued by what Carolina said when she said there was a set of countries that were preferred for cooperation. And you listed, I think, six countries or so. And I was quite surprised by that. And this, uh, this constant uh, and, and non-changing attraction of the North, always the validation by the North, whereas much of the data come from the South. And, and that uh, is something that we at the IU try to uh, help revert, but we have not been so successful, I must admit, uh, over, over the years. But we will continue to challenge that, this balance of, um, of cooperation and, and this need to, to uh, re-equilibrate how we work together. The, your suggestion, uh, Ahmed, very, or not suggestion, but the reality that we have to face much better is that when questions are issued for research, they need to be co-created, co-crafted in order for 
any kind of research that involve uh, partners will be mutually uh, beneficial in a, in a much better way. Um, I, I would like to get back to the notion of trust and maybe that's where Jenny could come um, back in as well. It's a lot of this is about trust. What kind of trust uh, do we see in uh, research cooperation, research collaboration? And how, how does that work? And, and how does that translate when we also publish um, in um, a peer reviewed journal or, or open science journals or any kind of journal? And then that actually um, gets back to the question asked by Noel Kufain, uh, where um, the question was asked and how to then translate the research outcomes back to, the, to society is, is very important. So I wanted to maybe just push a little bit further there. Sure, happy to answer this question um, with some really practical advice based on my experience. And I've had eight amazing years in Ahmed's country of South Africa. I came in as a Fulbrighter from the global north with all my privileges, with misconceptions and a lot of naive naivete going to South Africa on a Fulbright. So this is just some lessons, but also some practices. So um, trust, right? Like, why would they trust me, this American who thinks she knows everything, right? When I actually, I didn't know anything. Um, but as part of, and this is something I suggest for those of you who are writing grant proposals as well, is built into that was a, a research plan where I was going to disseminate not just put this in top journals, but also to provide the institutions that I was working with my full raw data, as well as our own institutional report. That's not incentivized and it's not rewarded, but I think it's a social responsibility that we all share is that whenever we collect data from another place, that data should be owned by that place, right? So to in full transparency, disclose the data, be available, answer questions and provide that but as opposed to taking the data from the South, extracting it and taking it and putting it out there in the global North, right? So that's one way. And, you know, again, this took time. Um, in addition, in the publications that I've done in South Africa, they've been co-authored with uh, South African students and or scholars. Um, I think that's really important to consider. Um, in, and there's also um, a, a book uh, Professor Chika Sahul and I edited. And in this book, the chapters are written by uh, emerging scholars of various African countries as a way to forecast their work from their perspectives. So there's, there's many ways to do this in ways that build trust, that initially require trust, but also are ways to develop partnerships, which is not just co-authorship, but it's a co-relationship that uh, builds capacity in both sides. It is possible, it's doable. And on that note, precisely, it's hard to believe, but we are now out of time. So I just want to say uh, to take this opportunity to once again thank professors Jenny Lee, Ahmed Bawa, and Carolina Guzman Valenzuela for your very, very valuable insights today, and our colleagues at the International Association of Universities for your partnership in putting together this webinar. Thank you all for joining us, and we look forward to having you join a forthcoming event, uh, both by IAU. CIHE or any of the opportunities that our colleagues uh, put together in future. We look forward to collaborating precisely on this topic and many others. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.